Praise be Jesus Christ and forward with Mary. Happy and holy evening to all of you, dear children. Welcome back to our unmissable appointment, I hope for you, also for me, who do it, of the Tuesday evening catechesis that we call Bella Coast Tuesdays. This evening, as we announced, we'll focus on the second part of the famous report of the speech given by Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre in Rome during the post conciliar storm on June 6, 1977. The last time, the day before Tuesday, we saw the first part, and I just wanted to say that I'm sorry that this morning the live broadcast was interrupted on a very important topic. We will see if I can resume uh, with it tomorrow morning, because I find it very important. The title, do you remember it? Uh, this morning it was Archbishop Lefebvre. Who was he really? Then I aired a video and unfortunately they blocked it immediately, but perhaps tomorrow morning I will return to the subject because Lefebvre is being pulled from all sides. Viganò uh, pulls him, the traditionalists pull him to their side, the Lefebvreists uh, pull him for obvious reasons, the uh, Radio Spada pulls him, they pull it here and there and pull him everywhere. But to whom really does Lefebvre belong? Because all these which I've mentioned to you are all to be ascribed, and since I have no enemies, I'm I'm going to look for them. They are all to be ascribed to the galaxy of the so-called set of vacantists. But was Archbishop Lefebvre a set of vacantists? No. Archbishop Lefebvre was not a set of vacantists. He never was. So it may be that tomorrow then I will show one, uh, a video by Archbishop Lefebvre, in which he clearly says, amongst other things, he was already very old by then, when he was already coming to terms with the decline of his mission, he says very clearly, precisely, that the Church needs the Patrian Munus, it needs the Pope. He says, I recognize, I recognize the Pope. And by the way, you know that, as I've told you on other occasions, this is history. Some figures have left the seminaries of Archbishop Lefebvre, even on the Italian scene, who are now acting on their own, because they wanted to push uh, him towards the set of Akentis direction, and Archbishop Lefebvre has put them to the door. Well, this is remarkably interesting. So it is useless for those like Radio Spada or Viganò to take uh, his side, because it must be said, it is an intellectually dishonest operation because Archbishop Lefebvre was not a set of Akentis. One more thing I'd like to say, we found out from this report by tonight, some, including those we have just mentioned, are pulling him to their side to fight the Novus Ordo Mass, as they say. Now, it is, not, uh, it is not that I must come and tell you that they are right about the fact that in comparison, the Mass of Pope Paul VI has only to lose. It is not that I must come and say that the, uh, the priest who celebrates the Mass uh, by the sea on a mattress is possible because the right of Paul VI existed that today there is the dew coming down, <clears throat> as some have said, and that, uh, and, that the, and that have transformed the Lord's Prayer, etc. We are not discussing that. There, there are other matters to discuss. The question is, like those avant-garde in the tradition, the black squadrons, as I call them, is that they refer to the Feb to say that this Mass is worth nothing. I'd remind you that last Tuesday we quoted this passage. Lefebvre says, unless he wanted to con contradict himself and was not honest, but for me this is not at stake, because I do not believe that Lefebvre, like all saints and prophets, witnesses of the faith, was someone who publicly said one thing and privately thought another, or vice versa. He said, I do not say that the new Mass is heretical. Now many refer to Lefebvre and say that the new Mass is heretical. He said that, I never said that, nor have I ever said that the Mass is invalid in itself. So I would like to understand, to whom does Archbishop Lefebvre really belong to? How to settle this question today? I want to make my contribution to this as well, even on this issue. You can see that I was born for burning issues. You can see that I have a nose for demanding situations. It is because I have a militant animus. I do not know. 
I'm willing to clarify finally to whom Lefebvre really belongs. He does not belong to those who say that uh, he is their Abraham, that he is their father in the faith, because then, as Radio Spada says, they allow themselves to pronounce and spit venom on Paul VI, on, on Pope John Paul II, and Pope Benedict XVI. This Lefebvre would never, ever have allowed and did not allow, and yet Lefebvre is theirs. So also Vigano, who, as we know, has an increasingly unclear position and does not feel the need to clarify it, but he refers to Lefebvre, uh, to Lefebvre this and to, Lefe- and to Lefebvre that, but Lefebvre has never been a Sedevacantist. Well, this was to be specified, since then this morning the live broadcast went away, so it was worth clarifying. Now, however, let's continue with the reading of this vibrant, I would say, prophetic statement by Lefebvre that certainly, I would like to say one more thing, it was escaping me, I think my guardian angel, and it is this, I really thank him because you will see that this is something I have said on other occasions. I say this to my faithful present here, and it is this, I have noticed a certain attitude that, in me, I hope, you have never seen, of satisfaction with the way things are uh, going in the, in the uh, Catholic Church after the Council. On the contrary, there is a form of sadistic cynicism on the part of these realities in seeing how the Church suffers, how the Church is suffering, how the Church is living. As Brother Celestino has said on several occasions, it's Good Friday. Lefebvre was never shown that arrogant satisfaction that circulates in these parts, for example, of Radio Spada, and other circles. I'm, I'm a Lefebvreist. I know that many esteem me, but I'm a Lefebvreist who is satisfied with how things are going on in the Catholic Church, as if to say, you have seen, we were right. So far, thank God, I have not found him. I would hope uh, to never meet him, because he is never truly a man of God who is satisfied with how uh, things are uh, going on currently in the Roman Catholic Church. Archbishop Lefebvre was one. Uh, those who knew him uh, know this, and this especially in the years close to, to the end, between the second half of the 1970s and the first half of the 1980s. It was a crucified Lefebvre, but you can also hear it in his voice. He suffered. I would almost say that God, who would discover it better and better, I presume this, had made him feel the pain, even physical, of the church. He and his body felt the pain that the church suffered. He was not one to take things lightly. He was not a challenger in the manner of liberation theologians in, in, in another way, you see. He was not a Hans Kung in black. Uh, do you know Hans Kung? These theologians, Karl Rahner, uh, who do I know, uh, Walter Kasper, who have always had the satisfaction of putting their finger in the wound, of contesting, of criticizing the church as it is, because it must be in another way. But there you see the intellectual arrogance of these individuals. Do you understand me? The arrogant satisfaction of intellectual hubris that takes pleasure in highlighting the crisis. I've never seen anything like it in that holy man there, in Lefebvre. I've never seen anything like that in that holy man. Always more sorrowful for the way life is in the church. I know it is important to say these things because I was not able to say this morning, but I'll give him the floor right uh, right away. But uh, But I must. So he has always suffered because the church suffers. I said one last very personal consideration, because the Lefebvre affair needs to be clarified more. We cannot allow them to pull him from one side or to the other. Of course, we leave to the Lefebvres all the freedom to feel it as a, as a duty, as their founder, their father, but I believe it is the time when Lefebvre must belong to all true Catholics. John Paul II excommunicated him. This was a serious matter because Karl Rahner got away with it. How is it that a holy man, an apostle of Mary, look like Wotila, <clears throat> excommunicated Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre? So, first, this morning I was saying, I said this naturally with a, a certain pain, but that von Balthasar has fallen into the trap of slanderous manipulation of Lefebvre to the point of calling him a non Catholic. And this is von Balthasar. It is evident that the collaborators kept saying to John Paul II, it is so, it is there. Is that so? It's there. And therefore they pressured him, especially the Masonic cardinals, to get rid of Lefebvre. They gave him the report, because Lefebvre at a certain point 
and this is the background, Lefebvre at a certain point uh, got a cancer diagnosis and they gave him uh, very little time to live. At one point they told him there was not much more time. Now for some time he had been pressing the Holy See for the approval of the Episcopal consecration of four of his priests to be consecrated bishops. Here we go. And the Holy See was biding its time, waiting for him to die. The Holy See uh, governed independently of John Paul II because we know that the popes of the post-conciliar period practically only had to protect themselves and uh, did what they could. And the Holy See, I mean the Freemason cardinals, so I'm not talking about Pope John Paul II, nor about the prefect of the, of the Congregation of the Faith, Joseph Ratzinger, but about others like Achille Silvestrini, who died a few years ago, who were clearly Freemasons, and was one of the proponents of the condemnation of Lefebvre, who worked very hard to have Lefebvre excommunicated. They were waiting concisely, this is what I heard, for Lefebvre to die. So what did they do? Well, he went, uh, he went, Lefebvre, to wait to see if they could, if they would give him this, because everything was in order. Look, what Lefebvre did up to the consecration, as we shall now see, was illegitimate. Up until that point, everything was normal. Unfortunately, they, they threw him into the trap. Something that's very painful. A man of God, you see. Now, let us start looking at the history of the church. Uh, Don Minutella is open to this because he has clear ideas. They threw Archbishop Lefebvre into the trap, into the lion's den. There, instead of the lions fed by the beasts, so he was excommunicated because others got away with terrible things. Incredible. That is, Karl Rahner, director of the Reforming Cabinet of the Second Vatican Council, died getting away with it. Archbishop Lefebvre died of grief because he was excommunicated. Who really deserved it? Let us start asking yourselves this question to see how to overcome the, this impasse, to look at the Catholic Church looking at the dawn like a corolla coming out of the snow. Who really deserved excommunication? Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre or Karl Rahner, for example. Several liberation theologi theologians left free in Latin America to express their heretical points of view with the real courses of heresy were unpunished. Beyond some action of, say, let, let us say, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, at a certain point, seemed to be the problem in the church. How much that man must have suffered there. He died of grief from that as well. So concisely, they told him. They made him understand that they were giving him this. Did John Paul II really know uh, everything about these dynamisms? We cannot know. What did those who were the long-distance collaborators say to John Paul II? Because they were waiting for Lefebvre to die, so he, by dying, ended all this concern to guard the incalculable treasure of the traditional Mass. We are all indebted to Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre and Benedict XVI with the Sumorum Pontificum. That is all there is to it. When he saw that he was already beginning to feel unwell, that he was short of breath, when he felt that death was approaching, he decided to make a drastic choice to consecrate the four priests without the authorization of the Holy See. Because he knew with all evidence that the consecration would be entirely valid even if illicit. Illegality, illegality is something different from validity. That is, those four bishops from whom I'm now, uh, I'm now out because the Judases are never lacking in that world of tradition. Then an atmosphere was created around Archbishop Lefebvre. Remember Williamson? I don't know if you remember the Holocaust denial bishop. For God's sake, I tell you, <clears throat> be that as it may, he consecrated four of them and he felt serene because in any case he foresaw, as he later did, 
that he would soon die, but at least others with apostolic succession, because bishops are successors of the apostles. They would be able to carry on his work. Now, in the last month, there was a big, big problem, a big, big discussion because the Daily Compass had written that the Lefebvre's, what was the reason for that? That the Lefebvre's are, 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 are out, that the Society of St. Pius X is outside the Catholic Church because they don't accept either the Second Vatican Council or the Mass. Because the Lefebvre is truly clear here. I read it again. I am not making anything up. He says, I'm not saying that the new Mass is heretical. I've never said that. I've never said that this Mass is not valid in itself. Now, someone is circulating some message, some information by Lefebvre about the fact that then, at a certain point, he considered it invalid. That is the Mass of Paul VI. I'm not an expert on this, so I cannot uh, vouch for it, of course. But I do read what I have available. Well, having said all this, now let's go, let us continue with this extraordinary report that Lefebvre gave in Rome during the storm. I, and I say, post conciliar, and I say, if only they had listened to him. Let us see what he says. He says, it was, says Lefebvre, the Lord himself who said, I am the vine and you are the branches. We must be united to life, to the root of the vine, if we want to bear fruit. Our Lord is the door of the fold. He said these things when those were the times, however, when a theology, a Christology of the historical Jesus was increasingly affirmed, wasn't it? In a neo arian version, a Jesus who no longer even knew why he was going to die, who died crying out in despair, as Enzo Bianchi said, uh, to quote, My God, my God, why have you for abandoned me? And as Vito Mancuso says, no less, Vito Mancuso, I recommend him to you, that Jesus expected to be able to have on the cross even those shamanic uh, powers that he had while he was on the, um, you know, those things that were becoming established there. And look at what he says. But if Paul VI uh, had, had had, he had it, but to the end, he had the courage to listen to him without prejudice. He says, you can't do anything without me. Sine mie nihile putistis facere, said our Lord. Nihil, nothing, says Lefebvre. It's very serious. It follows that we need to be united to our Lord Jesus Christ by the sacrifice of the Mass, by the cross, by his blood. Now, all the sacraments have, all, have been modified in the sense of a human communion, only human, no longer supernatural communion, a kind of collectivization. They have collectivized the sacraments. Here he gives examples. He says it uh, with sorrow. But it is true. It was all recorded in the news. Baptism has become only an initiation into a religious community, an entry into a community. And that is true. If you look at the Novus Ordo, the rite of baptism, the emphasis is placed on entry into the community. And Lefebvre says, it is no longer the destruction of the original sin in order to be purified by the blood of Jesus Christ to rise again in the blood of Jesus Christ, to turn away from sin and from Satan by means of the exorcisms that were done in baptism. There were seven of them. There are seven exorcisms. He is right. Archbishop Lefebvre is right. The, the Vetus Ordo, the rite of baptism of Vetus Ordo, has seven exorcisms. In the Novus Ordo, everything has disappeared. There's barely a trace, however, of an evil spirit. You know, the, the Dutch Catechism, meanwhile, just at that time there, uh, was turning the reference to Satan, to the devil, to something as undefined as just evil. But evil can be anything. Even a mosquito that bites you, that bites you, in short, that sucks blood, is evil. And this is that, uh, deliver us from evil. What is this evil if it remains undefined? And in the Novus Ordo, it is like that. So Lefebvre emphasizes this quite a bit. Baptism and the traditional rite emphasize precisely the immersion, the immersion in the blood of Christ in order to be freed from the power of Satan. So naturally, all of this led, as Lefebvre implies, to a transformation of the paradigm of faith. If baptism is, uh, is only an initiation into the religious community, it can be useful to everyone, even to non-Christians. The same concept is found in communion. Co uh, communion is now an assembly, a kind of collectivity, 
that communicates itself that breaks bread. We also have collective absolution, collective penance. Yes, in those years, the habit of no longer listening to the so-called individual earpiece was spreading there. It was spreading in Anglo-Saxon countries. The confession, on the other hand, no longer existed in the year. There was confession, the one with general absolution, that is collective. That is it, collective. We have collective absolution, collective penance. It follows that the priest is no longer the sacrificer marked by a priestly character to offer the holy sacrifice of the Mass, but becomes the president of the assembly. And this magic word, I remember in the seminary, they stuffed us uh, with this project, the president of the assembly. And of course, because it is a community and the priest is no longer uh, the one who suffers, who offers the sacrifice, but is the president of the assembly. It is a Protestantization of the faith. There is nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong which should not be approved. And he continues, but if the priest is only a president, look here how prophetic he is, he will be able to be chosen from among the faithful, and consequently the celibacy of priests will no longer be necessary. This is in 1977. In this way, the priest will be perfectly married. Again, in 1977. It is no secret that at the accursed synod uh, of the first phase, which ended last October 2023, they discussed the possibility of celibacy to be abolished by priests as in the synod in Germany. They want this. The, the priest, since he's no longer the one who offers a sacrifice in persona Christi of the Holy Mass, but is the president of the association. Overall, this is what happens in the Lutheran and evangelical churches. There is the pastor who is married with children because he does not have an ontological sacramental configuration to Christ, the head. He is the representative of Christ in the community. It is the community that chooses it. And many times, uh, it can also be a woman, the shepherdess. In Berlin and northern Germany, there are pastors because uh, it is the community that chooses the pastor. But on a timetable because it is, uh, it is enough for him to study sacred scripture and, and give us lessons. So it is. It is not a joke on time. On the other hand, in the Catholic tradition, and we know this, the priest is ontologically configured to Jesus Christ. All this, says Lefebvre, derives from the new conception of the Church. They even go as far as to collectively give last rites. In Lourdes, in the Marian city, they invited all those who were over 65 years of age to gather to receive all of them, collectively, the last rites. This is very serious, because in this way the sacrament is no longer valid. The subject of extreme unction must be to a sick person. And until now, I did not know that after 65 years of age, we are all sick. It is not because we are 65 years of, of age that we are sick. Si quis infirmatur, says St. James. If anyone is sick, let him come to the priest, administer them, and so on. But if he is not sick, he continues, he cannot be the subject of extreme unction. This is serious because it, de it, it denotes this new orientation. I must insist because everything derives from the new definition of the Church, from having changed the concept of the Church, and it has been changed to arrive at communion with all religions. This, finally, and I take responsibility for what I say, was the Fev's real concern. The goal is, let us say, to take away the identity. The identity of Roman Catholicism, which Roman Catholicism has always been characterized by a strong uh, identity. And at the Synod, they did nothing but say that the reality of identity is contradictory and anti-evangelical, correct? But what is the end goal here? It is the syn syncretistic pantheon, that is, the cauldron. The, the Antichrist comes to bring all religions together. And Lefebvre foresaw this. And he goes on, in order to arrive at communion with all religions, he says, it was necessary to change the cult, the liturgy, 
could not be left untouched. Our liturgy was too Catholic. It manifested too clearly the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ with the cross over sin, over the world, over death. It is victory, therefore, uh, a change. It is the sign of the struggle to arrive at the final victory. It fights against sin, against all the enemies of the church, against everything that opposes our eternal salvation and eternal life. Everything has been changed. If I had more time, he says, but I don't. I don't want to abuse your patience. I would tell you about a work I had uh, one of our fathers do on the modifications of the prayers. It is an extraordinary study to see the spirit in which they conducted the liturgical reform. The liturgical prayers have been modified in the, in the pacifist sense. There are no more heretics. There are no more enemies of the church. There is no more original sin. There is no longer any need to fight. There are no more spiritual struggles. How true this is, and, uh, and what soft priestly gruel we've had uh, come out after the council. A gentrified uh, priest class, enjoying life with gilded studies, extremely secularized, incapable of militancy, incapable of taking the field to defend the faith, because there is no longer any struggle. The church no longer had any enemies, apparently. Original sin was just a fairy tale, apparently. <clears throat> Canon Rose, a Belgian member of the liturgical commission who resigned, indignant at what was happening, did a work on the liturgy of the dead. This will fall like a bean these days. Work in which he shows that dogmas have been suppressed in the liturgy of the dead of the Novus Ordo. It is true, I arrived at it alone. The word soul no longer exists. It is true, it is true. I got this on my own. When I celebrated the Mass of the Dead with the Novus Ordo, uncomfortably, I must tell you the truth, I confess. Then I surpassed him with the homily because I clarified things. But the eocology, as it is called, that is the set of liturgical texts, texts was embarrassing because they are all Protestant. They make people believe that the dead, Protestants believe this, all die and then rise again when Jesus Christ returns to earth. There is no view of the intermediate existence of the soul separated from the body, which receives the judgment and can go to heaven, hell, or purgatory. It is all gone. Lefebvre shouted this. Why, why, why did the word, the word soul disappear? Because there is no longer a distinction between the body and the soul. There is no longer any talk of purgatory. It is amazing. All this to please non-Catholics, to be able to be uh, with all those who do not believe what we believe. We do not believe in the distinction between the soul and the body. But we must remain Catholic. We, we cannot suddenly become members of all religions, change our entire liturgy to please them. A capital change is the change of the Feast of the Christ King. You know that we recently celebrated the liturgical solemnity of Jesus, our Lord Jesus Christ, King of the Universe, and it is celebrated on the last Sunday of October. However, on the last Sunday, in fact, before the Solemnity of All Saints, Pope Pius XI commissioned it to honor the martyrs who died to the cry of long live Christ the King. Lefebvre says, we no longer want the social kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Feast of Christ the King was placed at the end of the liturgical year because he will come in the parousia, at the end of the world. Here on earth, it must no longer remain or, or only over uh, individuals, strictly speaking, in private, in families, but no longer publicly, no longer on civil society. And of course, Lefebvre, I imagine, could not have foreseen that the European Union would be born, which is not only non-Christian, but also anti-Christian. I don't have to invent anything. It is there for all to see. In the hymn of Christ, the King, the two stanzas that asked our Lord to be the king of the family, of the state, of the city, have been suppressed. It is clear why they have uh, been suppressed. Here's a verse that has been suppressed. Te nazione preside sonore tolant publico, colant magistri, judis, legis et artes experiment. It is the reign of our Lord over the peoples, the lawyers, the judges, the laws, and the arts. 
they all must honor our Lord Jesus Christ. All this has been has been eliminated. These are all very serious things. Who knows if uh, if he was aware of the fact? I think he was that if that it was Freemasonry that in the meantime was operating all this. Our religion changes. That's for sure. It's impossible not to say it. I would like to say that it is not true. That it is not possible. He says, I would like to say that what I'm saying is not true, but it is not possible. One thing that is no longer to be affirmed is that, absolutely, I, as it were, promote before all of you, my dear children of the little remnant, every single syllable of what you're now about to hear. Here, I, I subscribe with my blood. One thing that is no longer wanted to be affirmed is that the church is the only true religion. But is it true or not? If we do not believe that the Catholic Church is the true religion, why are we here? That is what I said to the press who asked me, why aren't you more uh, pluralist, uh, pluralistic? But I do not believe in pluralism. I do not believe in ideological pluralism, in the pluralism of truth. There is but one truth. There are not many truths. There may be uh, more than a thousand religions in the world. We can be part of Jehovah's Witnesses, Pentecostals, Mormons. Why have a religion that is more difficult than the others, more demanding, harder, given that there is now pluralism? Why go on a mission? This is all especially important. As the mission has been transformed, they no longer uh, proclaim Jesus Christ, because it is obvious that if he is not the only savior of the world, and the church is not the only true religion, then it is useless. Everyone should keep the God he wants. And Lefebvre could never have imagined that the Pachamama uh, would then be brought into the Vatican. Why go on a mission if all the people are safe, if all are ready to go to heaven? With the pluralism of truths, they have destroyed the missionary spirit. The missionary congregations are empty. There are no more vocations. It is true. Look, there are some congregations of ancient, ancient missionary tradition that are fruitless. For example, there are the Jesuits. Religious pluralism is that of Father Sosa, superior general of the Jesuits, who prays alongside Buddhists and the uh, stupa of uh, Nepal. Understood? To say pluralism. And if we believe that there is only one truth, the only true religion is that of the Catholic Church, because it was founded by God himself. Today we'll be told that these arguments are fundamentalist, as if they're coming from the Taliban. This is, this is Catholic fundamentalism. But Goya would say, this is Talibanism. We believe that Jesus Christ is God and Jesus Christ founded the Catholic Church. I believe in unum deum. I believe in unum dominum Jesum Christum. I believe in unum baptisma. Not in two, but unum, unum, unum. He said, as it were, inflamed by the passion of faith. So, do we have faith or don't we have it? If we have the Catholic faith, faith, we believe that the only true religion is Catholic because it was founded by God Himself. He gave us the sacrifice of the cross, the sacrifice of the Mass. My seminarians are convinced of this truth. It is true. We can highlight anything negative we want if somebody, but there's one thing above all that saves the, the Lefebvre's world, the Mass. Lefebvre says, my seminarians are convinced of this truth, that the most beautiful thing on earth is the sacrifice of the Mass. You know that we have started a formative experience with a couple of young people and we want to hope that this will uh, be the case for them too. Again, he continues, it's not a Protestant lunch. No, it is not a lunch to be able to pronounce. He is addressing the seminarians. He spoke to them like this. To be able to pronounce the words of the consecration for a young priest is the most beautiful thing in his life. I do not know why Lefebvre said for a young priest. Here, I would say for a priest. I'm one who, who talks a lot with all evidence. However, when I pronounce the words hoc est enem corpus meum, ic est calic sanguinis, etc., 
They are the words that fully constitute me, without which I would have no reason to exist. I thank the Lord. If I say this uh, in, a, in an autobiographical way, I thank the Lord because I asked on the day of my ordination, there would not be a single day of my priestly life without Mass. I've been a priest for 24 years next month. Uh, there's not been a single day without Mass, a single day. During the years of the seminary, he says, uh, when I go up to the altar and can pronounce the words of the consecration to do the sacrificial action to bring down God, our Lord God himself, because while in the other seminaries, a sociological vision was inculcated. Lefebvre wanted his seminarians to, lo- to learn the value, above all, of offering of the Holy Mass. That is why we are priests first. He thinks, he thinks that he himself will have the power to bring down God down from heaven uh, to the altar, just as the Virgin Mary with her fiat made the word of God descend into her womb. This comparison is simply extraordinary. Let us conclude like this. And there will be, of course, a third installment on this, on this historical prophetic relationship of Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. We conclude as follows. Therefore, when the priest pronounces the words of the consecration, he sends our Lord down into the host. That is said in a way that is so, uh, how to say, immediate. But is that, it is everything, it is everything. The priest, when he pronounces the words of the consecration, sends our Lord down into the host. It is a thing, says the Feb, but uh, who spoke like that at that time? And that's why Padre Pio kissed his hand. It is a wonderful thing, says the Febre. It's divine, a mysterious, incomprehensible, unheard of thing. That is what the priest is. He is not a community animator, or a social animator, or a president. He has a priestly character imprinted on his soul to be a sacrificer. How clear can these words be? You, he said in 1977 to the people who listened to him in Rome, need these priests. The faithful ask for these priests. They want Holy Mass. Communion is not the main thing. In the Holy Mass, the essential thing is the sacrifice. The sacrament of the Eucharist is the fruit of the sacrifice. We share with the victim who has been offered. It seems to me that the message is absolutely Catholic in every syllable. There is nothing to object to Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre, who does not present himself precisely here as a revolutionary opponent of the post-conciliar liturgical reform, but who highlights that this reform has created many problems. And he prophetically foresaw the collapse that today, with all evidence, we are witnessing. Beloved, let us pray to him, Archbishop Lefebvre, that he may intercede for us from heaven. Let us pray that Our Lady will protect us in this time of great confusion. And we will meet again a third time to continue this extraordinary reflection on Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre in 1977. Praise be Jesus Christ and forward with Mary.